Hello and welcome to our optional video, a little intro to Geisha A Life. We'll be spending four weeks on this. All right, so our book here, this is the only book written by our author. So she worked as a geisha, but more than that, she actually started out uh, as a little kid that was essentially adopted by the woman who ran, who kind of owned the geisha house. So when she gets adopted, it's not just to be a geisha, but to take over for this woman and be the next, you know, uh, owner of the, the geisha house. But first she works as a geisha, and before that she works as an apprentice geisha at Maiko. So anyhow, uh, you're going to get her earliest memories all the way to the age of like three or four, all the way through to when she retires. So you're going to get a nice look at childhood in Japan at this time period when she was you know four or five, all the way up through middle school, high school aged, an adult, young adult kind of getting out on her own and making some interesting mistakes given that she was so sheltered from many things. And then all the way through trying to change some of the, the geisha mentality and rules and whatnot, and then retiring. I will give you one big warning. Uh, when she's about middle school aged, there's a, a cousin who's staying in the geisha house. He's not really supposed to, but he's, he's kind of staying in the house. And he will try to uh, to, to rape her. Uh, he will get stopped. Uh, but this scene, while it, it is only part of a page, it could be traumatizing to some people. So just a warning that that's coming. You will have ample warning. It's pretty clear that it's about to happen. But you know, I just want to give you a warning on that. So this book style, uh, obviously, she writes, you know, it's a memoir. So she's writing first person. Uh, sometimes she will give a few hints to what's going to happen, which, you know, of course, she knows what's going to happen because she's writing this as an adult, thinking back to her childhood. Um, one of the interesting things that you'll see, though, is a change in one of her uh, big sisters, who's called Mini, and then old Mini, and then later kind of maybe not so mean. So you'll go through in the style. Um, it's maybe not you know Shakespearean as far as the you know the literary style, but it's still it's quite well written. Uh, we do have to deal with translation issues when it comes to books like this. So you'll keep in mind that the words aren't exactly clearly chosen or painstakingly chosen like they may be in a poem that's in a native language, but uh, still it's quite well written. It's a really fast read. You'll be kind of surprised how quickly you get through it. But as far as the book goes, you'll you'll notice it is a, a pretty substantial book. Uh, it would take some time to get through this in a classroom. So when you're looking at this, I want I want to approach it with the idea of how can I use this entire book in my classroom? I would look at it as what parts of this book, sections, chapters, whatever, could you pull out and use in your classroom? Uh, obviously, there's social studies applications. You're looking at, you know, the Japanese culture, and some history. Um, you're looking at world studies as well. Um, she's going to interact with different politicians. So then you start getting some, you know, uh, kind of world studies, government, social studies mixtures in there. ELA, obviously, going to have some implications here. But also, look at it from the point of view of art. She's going to go into some detail about... You know, her parents made kimonos. Uh, she's going to talk about her kimonos. She's going to go into detail about what they look like and you know details about them. She's going to talk about the makeup artists, uh, dance, music, all these different things. So if you wanted to look at art, there's going to be ample sections in here that you could pull out and really analyze some of those things. And you could pull out some great visuals in your class to go over or audio files to go over. So just kind of keep some of that in mind. All right, so a few things about geisha. If you're not familiar with geisha at all, there's uh, there's geisha, and then there's the apprentice geishas, the maikos, uh, sometimes called gaikos, um, but I prefer the term maiko. So maiko, these are the apprentices. If you're familiar with the European guild style of you know, young child, you know, so, uh, their parents pay a master to teach them, and then the child goes from apprentice to journeyman and from journeyman to hopefully master if, if they're able to. 
that's a very similar style to the geisha world. You know, they start out now after middle school. You have to complete middle school to become an apprentice geisha, a maiko, and you start out. There's some slight differences in their looks. You can find pictures like the one on the screen here. They'll show you that the hair's a little different, the makeup's a little different, the the uniform is a little different. So there's that. Um, not everyone who starts out as a Maiko becomes a geisha, obviously. But there are a lot of rigid traditions as far as how they have to behave, how they have to act, uh, uh, who's allowed in the house, what they're allowed to say, do, um, all these different things. And also rigid schooling into certain areas. You know, a geisha above all else is a entertainer. Their job is to basically make a party pop. So whether that's through conversation, which is a very important piece of being a geisha. So they have to be able to be familiar with the topics that are popular to talk about or you know, the important client who's coming. They need to know about them a little bit. Then you've got you know, dance, uh, music, singing, all sorts of different things that they have to be good at. Now, not every geisha is going to be equally good at different things all the same things. You know, some will be better at dance or certain dances. Some will be better at certain musical instruments. Some will be better at, you know, conversation. But they all need to have appreciation of art and the different performances, things like that. One misconception that is kind of common in the United States and some European countries is that geisha means prostitute. And it, it very much it, it does not. Uh, geisha are independent women in, in a certain sense where if they hit it off with someone at one of the parties and you know they want to you know, go home with that person they can they're allowed to have boyfriends uh, whether it's a uh, long-term short-term multiple boyfriends but there's no expectation there's no requirement that they you know engage in you know, adult things. So uh, if you saw the movie, uh, oh, was that uh, Memoirs of a Geisha? That, that is fiction. Although there's a book I'm going to get to later on that is actually very similar to that because there were women who have been translated as Geisha that were sex workers that, that worked in the, the red light districts or, you know, the brothels. And then, of course, after World War II, there were a lot of women who were, I believe that, the colloquial term at the time was streetwalkers, uh, who might call themselves geisha and might even appear a little bit like geisha, but they were not. Uh, again, there are strict rules and practices and laws for geisha. Uh, for example, when a geisha retires, she's not allowed to do any of the dances that she had been working on for decades prior to that. So there's a lot of strict rules. You'll get to some of those in the book. And some of it might be a little surprising, some of it might not. All right, so some additional books if you're looking for strong female uh, memoirists. Autobiography of a Geisha. If you've seen Memoirs of a Geisha, this is actually a lot more similar to that movie. So this, this young lady was sold to a brothel. Uh, she calls herself a Geisha. She was not a Geisha as far as like the actual Geisha are concerned. What she was was essentially a somewhat trained brothel employee. Uh, her job was to, you know, entertain the male customers. Um, but as far as the entertainment goes, less on the conversation and art and dance. In fact, I think the author had a, a leg issue that would have kept her from being able to be a good dancer. Um, her entertainment was more of a traditional brothel type. And she was owned by the brothel. Um, then there's Yakuza Moon, uh, very difficult memoir to get through at times. So she's the daughter of a Yakuza, uh, a mob boss, and uh, she ends up rebelling against her family, and that leads her down some roads, making some bad choices, including drugs and alcohol, and then some very abusive relationships. Eventually, she gets kind of gets uh, her life figured out and tries to become the person that she really wants to be 
there's a, a manga version of it as well. I'm not as big a fan of the manga. I think it takes out a lot of subtlety that's in the memoir and kind of makes some of her actions seem a little more two-dimensional. But it is fun to compare the two if you do want to read them both, by all means. It, there's a lot of greatness there. And then there's a, a famous artist. You may or may not be familiar with her. So we've got, this is actually a biography of her. It's maybe not super, oh, well, none of these really are particularly classroom appropriate, given that we have a, a brothel employee. So obviously some awkwardness there in the classroom. Yakuza Moon, lots of drug and alcohol use. There's uh, abuse, both parental and in relationship. And then there's some adult scenes in there as well, both in the, the manga and in the memoir. And then uh, with our artist here, she did a lot with uh, phallic shaped objects in her art and then uh, created some other types of art, for example, like a clothing that had um, holes cut into them so that women were appearing through their clothes. So things like that that are going to make it maybe not entirely classroom appropriate. Uh, plus, there's an early scene on where she sees her parents engaging in uh, uh, adult behavior that, again, maybe not super appropriate for the classroom, but there would be parts you could pull out of any of these that could be quite useful. And if you really liked if you really liked the book, Geisha Life, uh, you can look at Autobiography of a Geisha as kind of a counterpoint. It's a previous generation, so we're going back, uh, I think, about 50 years or so for Autobiography of a Geisha, and you can see the difference between, you know, uh, Entertainer Geisha and the Red Light District brothel type uh, sex worker. All right, so we're also going to have a video call as an optional thing for this class. We'll be able to get together. You give your last comments and questions you have about this book. We can talk about it, maybe possible classroom use, uh, whatever questions, comments, feelings that you want to cover. So that one will be optional. If you, I know I didn't cover a whole lot about Geisha here, other than some basics. There's a great video on YouTube if you're curious. I put a link to it on our website for an apprentice Geisha, a Maiko. It's a BBC documentary. It's like a four or five part series. It's quite interesting. I've used parts of it in my classes before. It is school appropriate, so no worries there. Um, I've never used the entire thing all the way through because Obviously, you know, four or five parts, it's, it's pretty long, but that's great. You can also find lots of videos on YouTube. Some of them are just people hunting for geisha. There's a couple of streets that are very famous for being able to catch glimpses of geisha and Maiko. So you can find all this stuff online. You can find pictures. You can find all sorts of stuff that would really add some, some flavor to your classroom or even just to your reading so you can pull up and have visuals as you go along. But that's all we've got. If you've got any questions, by all means, feel free to let me know. Uh, have fun reading.